Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for joining me on today's program. Today's program is from the Special Population Series. And today's program is entitled Exercise Prescriptions for Orthopedic Injury and Rehabilitation Clients, or in our case, we could refer to those as chiropractic patients. I have a fascinating program for you today, and it's a program that I'm sure will uh, provide invaluable information for you as you uh, handle your chiropractic patients that have specific conditions that uh, require your help uh, in the rehabilitation of those conditions. And uh, let me just take a moment to introduce myself to you. Uh, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'm a chiropractor. I've been a chiropractor for approximately 20 years eight years now. Uh, I graduated from Palmer West College of Chiropractic and uh, throughout the years I've taken many different types of continuing education courses and I list for you here some of the courses that I've completed uh, that qualify me to speak on today's topic and specifically uh, I'm going to be making uh, extra reference today to materials derived from the National Strength and Conditioning Association, of which I'm a member. I hold two credentials with the NSCA. I hold the Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist uh, credential and also the Certified Special Population Specialist credential. And today's material is largely based on ideas, references, uh, and concepts about rehabilitating and treating uh, persons who qualify as special populations. And today we're talking about that group of special populations that we find uh, in the chiropractic practice. And that is people who have uh, health care issues. Specifically, today we're talking about uh, injuries and issues with the musculoskeletal condition. So today's program is about injury, uh, orthopedic and rehabilitation patients and those certainly qualify as special populations and those are certainly people that have special and unique needs uh, perfectly suited to the work that we do as chiropractors. So I'm going to be supplementing uh, chiropractic material today uh, with additional material derived from the exercise sciences uh, and I will be quoting some references uh, from the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Uh, references for today's program are many. And uh, I draw your attention to a couple of textbooks from the National Strength and Conditioning Association. I'll be presenting information from the Essentials of Personal Training and also the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. Also draw upon material out of uh, Lippincott's Primary Care Orthopedics Second Edition. I'll refer to uh, Yoakum and Rowe Essentials of Skeletal Radiology, specifically when we get into a discussion later on on the rehabilitation of spondylolisthesis and spondylolysis. Uh, I'll be drawing on some physical examination procedures from the Fundamentals of Musculoskeletal Assessment Techniques. That's a fabulous textbook by uh, Palmer and Epler, a couple of physical therapists. I'll make also a brief reference to the AMA Guides 5th edition. And <clears throat> those of you that are qualified medical evaluators, uh, you'll recognize those references. And then I have a couple of specific uh, references for you relating to the shoulder and the lumbar spine. And I chose and selected these references for a couple of different reasons. Number one is they relate exactly to topics that we're going to be discussing, specifically related to the lumbar spine and specifically related to the shoulder. And also because each of these articles illustrates some general principles uh, that, are, that are extremely important principles that we understand. Uh, regarding injuries and rehabilitation in general. And I'm going to make early references to each of these principles uh, 
early in the program. And then when it comes time, when we get to the lumbar spine section, and when we get to the shoulder section, I will uh, reiterate these principles by drawing upon these references, uh, specifically as relates to uh, the region that we're considering, whether it be the shoulder uh, or the lumbar spine. And uh, I know you're gonna find these uh, references to be fascinating. And these are some principles that are illustrated in these references uh, that you can rely on and that you will rely on uh, in your practice from now uh, to forever. So let's talk about shoulder impingement syndrome. If you've been in chiropractic practice for any length of time, uh, there's a good chance that you've encountered uh, patients with shoulder impingement syndrome. And uh, if you're a busy chiropractor doing osseous adjustments, there's a good chance that you may have experienced uh, shoulder impingement syndrome yourself. So uh, let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, shoulder impingement syndrome involves a pinching or a compression uh, of the soft tissues underneath the acromion process which is known as the subacromial arch. So what are some of the soft tissues that pass underneath the subacromial arch? Well, as indicated in this diagram, we have the subacromial bursa, we have the supraspinatus uh, muscle and tendon, and note here the musculotendinous junction, which sits exactly underneath uh, the acromion process. We also have the long head uh, of the biceps tendon, which in various positions of elevation of the humerus bone, brings the long head of the biceps tendon directly underneath uh, the subacromial arch. And any one or any combination uh, of these soft tissues can become compressed, can become inflamed, and can become painful uh, in shoulder impingement syndrome. Now, there's many different causes of shoulder impingement syndrome. Some of those are structural. For example, any type of space occupying lesion that narrows uh, the space underneath the acromion process of the scapula is going to compromise uh, the tissues that pass through this narrowing space. So for example, a couple of structural causes include arthritis of the acromial clavicular joint, uh, and or anomalous shape of the acromion process. And if you have any experience reading MRI reports, uh, these are some findings that medical radiologists uh, routinely report. They will report on the presence or absence uh, of arthritis of the AC joint, and they will always describe uh, the shape of the acromion process as involving either a type one type two or a type three uh, acromion process. <clears throat> and I'll show you a diagram of those different types uh, of acromial processes in just a moment. Some of the functional causes of shoulder impingement syndrome include muscle imbalances, uh, muscle weakness, for example, weakness of the rotator cuff muscles, uh, poor posture, such as uh, thoracic kyphosis, poor scapular control, improper exercise technique, or other poor biomechanics. And we're gonna find that uh, this is something that uh, patients frequently cause themselves. They frequently cause themselves shoulder impingement syndrome due to lack of knowledge about the proper mechanics of the shoulder and the proper exercise technique to avoid impingement type symptoms. So here's a diagram uh, that shows uh, both of those structural causes that we talked about. Uh, this diagram here shows the space occupying nature of subacromial arthritis uh, and its narrowing imp uh, impact upon tissues that pass underneath the acromion process. So uh, what's being depicted here is a compression of the subacromial bursa, and red indicates inflammation, irritation, and pain <clears throat> in the subacromial bursa. Well, what impact or what effect could that have 
uh, on the supraspinatus tendon that passes underneath uh, the subacromial bursa. Well, indicated here by this diagram uh, is some fraying and some decay of the tendon uh, of the supraspinatus muscle, which also becomes inflamed, which also occupies space, and which also is a source uh, of symptoms, shoulder pain symptoms. Uh, here's a diagram of various configurations of acromion processes. So here is a side view of the scapula. This is the glenoid fossa. This is the coracoid process anteriorly. And then this is the acromion process coming off of the spine of the scapula. And this depicts a type 1 acromion process, a process which is flat and straight. And then the type 2 and the type 3 acromion processes involve various degrees and angles uh, of hooking of the acromion process, which conspire to compromise space in the subacromial arch and in the subacromial region and causes bony constriction and bony compression uh, on the contents of the sub subacromial space. So here is an x-ray uh, showing here in this diagram uh, a patent uh, subacromial space. Here's the acromion process with a type 1 uh, acromion. Over here we have the modified Y outlet view which shows a downward sloping and hooking acromion process thereby compressing and occupying space which would otherwise uh, be open and patent absent this downward slanting hook here. So this is an example of a structural impingement uh, on the structures in the subacromial space. Some of the physical examination findings uh, that will uh, tend to suggest uh, subacromial impingement syndrome include a positive Dawbarns sign. Dawbarns sign is uh, suggestive of subacromial bursitis. And then we have various impingement tests that we use. Uh, we have uh, impingement sign of near. We have the plain impingement sign. We have the Kennedy Hawkins test. And all of these are different maneuvers uh, designed to reproduce pain uh, within the subacromial space. Here's a diagram that shows uh, the impingement sign of Kennedy Hawkins. And uh, this is a very useful test, which will frequently and easily reproduce uh, symptoms uh, of impingement syndrome if they are present. Now, to perform the Kennedy-Hawkins maneuver, you bring the patient's arm up into 90 degrees of flexion. You bring the humerus into maximum internal rotation. And this diagram is being shown uh, with the examinee's elbow in full extension. I prefer to do the maneuver with the elbow in 90 degrees of elbow flexion. But regardless, uh, you simply rotate the humerus into maximum internal rotation and then apply at least 10 or more degrees of adduction. And I typically like to bring the elbow across the midline across the midline uh, of the sternum so that the elbow ends up over on the opposite side of the sternum. Once the position is proper, you simply apply downward pressure uh, both to the elbow and also to the wrist. Uh, with my maneuver, with the elbow flexed to 90 degrees, I apply downward pressure to the elbow here and then to the wrist, which ends up over here in this, in this particular uh, position. And the combined effect of those two applications of downward pressure is, number one, to require the examinee to elevate uh, or flex the shoulder under uh, resistance, and then also to externally rotate the shoulder under resistance. As it's demonstrated in this diagram, the examinee is only resisting uh, 
in the direction of flexion. The examinee is, 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 is flexing his shoulder against resistance as the examiner tries to push the elbow down into extension. With my maneuver, the examinee resists, uh, uh, performs, uh, well, resists uh, the examiner's attempt to extend the elbow and then also resists the examiner's attempt to further internally rotate uh, the head of the humerus. And this will provoke pain uh, of impingement syndrome if it's present. Okay, we also use the repetitive cross arm abduction sign. And uh, we won't have time to review that here, but you can uh, Google that if you're not familiar with that maneuver. So we know that the Kennedy-Hawkins maneuver, which involves flexion, adduction, and internal rotation, causes the greater tubercle of the humerus bone to occupy space and compromise space and pinch those soft tissues up against the subacromial arch. So therefore, any exercise or movement that your patient is involved with that involves flexion, internal rotation, and adduction uh, is going to perpetuate and reproduce symptoms. Now we have here a diagram uh, of a weight lifter performing resisted shoulder flexion with his elbows uh, higher than his glenohumeral joints. His humerus is in maximum internal rotation and this is the exact type of exercise and the exact type of motion that exacerbates shoulder impingement. Now, many of your patients may not be weightlifters and may not be athletes, but any maneuver of this type uh, will perpetuate shoulder impingement syndrome. So, for example, how about a grocery bagger who picks up cans, lifts them up and into the bag, setting the can down inside the bag a hundred times. That is 100 repetitions of a Kennedy Hawkins maneuver. <laughs> How about the examinee that sleeps on their side with their arm up and under their pillow and their head resting on their pillow on top of their arm while their arm is in flexion and internal rotation. It's this type of maneuver that's going to aggravate and perpetuate shoulder impingement syndrome. So the rule of thumb with shoulder impingement syndrome is don't recommend any motion that is painful to the examinee. Do not cause pain. And sometimes uh, maneuvers that you don't think would cause pain or should cause pain actually do cause pain. So the first principle is that none of these other principles apply if they cause the examinee pain. So first rule of thumb is do not cause pain. Well, what type of maneuvers would we expect would be typically associated or particularly causative uh, of pain? Well, any type of maneuver that involves shoulder flexion uh, with an internally rotated shoulders, such as overhead dumbbell presses, overhead barbell presses, uh, bench presses or inclined dumbbell presses. If you have an examinee that has a shoulder impingement syndrome, you might try them uh, on decline uh, bench presses rather than incline bench presses. Uh, lateral dumbbell raises, the way they're typically performed in health club, uh, are going to be contraindicated. Definitely contraindicated are upright rows, such as what this athlete here is demonstrating. This is an upright row maneuver. And then also other maneuvers that involve uh, internal rotation of the shoulder, such as bench dips, would be contraindicated. Uh, this shows an examinee here doing the side lateral raises. Notice that he has his shoulder here uh, in internal rotation and he's flexing the shoulder to greater than 90 degrees, which would be right along this plane here. 
And this is the type of maneuver where the greater tubercle of the humerus rotates and occupies space uh, up and under the subacromial arch and pinches uh, those soft tissues that we talked about. Here shows a woman performing dumbbell front raises. Again, her shoulder is in internal rotation. She's raising it to 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. And this is basically the Kennedy Hawkins maneuver, almost exactly. Uh, and so here she is performing uh, 10 or 12 or 15 repetitions uh, under load of a maneuver that continues to grind, 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 grind uh, those tissues in the subacromial space. Well, so what are the exercise guidelines uh, for shoulder impingement syndrome? Well, first and foremost is any exercise recommendation has to be completely pain-free for the patient. And this is going to typically involve pulling motions versus pressing motion. So they can do dumbbell row exercises, uh, lat pull-down exercises, seated row exercises, machine pulling exercises. It's the pressing maneuvers uh, that are going to be painful and are going to uh, perpetuate uh, the problem. Now, because uh, muscle imbalances in and around the shoulder and in particular in the rotator cuff are responsible for uh, contributing to uh, shoulder impingement syndrome, uh, <coughs> we need to strengthen uh, the rotator cuff muscles, especially uh, the external rotators, which are the infraspinatus and the teres minor muscles. So in this example, the examinee is performing resisted external rotations uh, to strengthen the infraspinatus and the teres minor muscles in the back. Strengthening the external rotator muscles helps to keep the head of the humerus from compressing and elevating uh, into the subacromial space during other exercises that involve the pectoral muscles, the deltoid muscles, uh, and even the bicep and tricep muscles. So strengthening the external rotators uh, becomes a primary focus uh, for these types of patients. And we want to progress from isolation, single uniarticular joint exercises to uh, multi-joint and compound exercises. So this is an example here where the examinee is doing a isolation uniarticular exercise, and this would be a good entry level uh, type of exercise for a pain. This is a poor picture, uh, but it is a good exercise. And this shows the patient uh, performing resisted shoulder external rotations, now using uh, a resistance band. And if this looks like a wimpy exercise, uh, I encourage you to go ahead and try it. Uh, this can uh, produce quite a fatigue effect in the uh, external rotator muscles. So uh, if you've never done this exercise, I encourage you to give this one a try. <laughs> uh, here shows uh, a prone exercise technique for performing shoulder external rotations. Uh, you'll notice that this is a uniarticular exercise. The only motion is occurring here at the glenohumeral joint. And this is an isolation exercise uh, for both the infraspinatus and for uh, the teres minor muscles. Okay, so there's a couple exercises uh, regarding shoulder impingement syndrome. Let's go on and talk now about uh, shoulder instability conditions.